Okay, I think we've got a critical mass here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I know we've got a really exciting event this evening and I wanna make sure we have all the possible time together. Uh, so my name is Amy Starczewski. I direct the Oral History Master of Arts program here at Columbia. And tonight's event is the first in our year long series on methodological experiments in oral history. Um, I think people often imagine that oral history is something kind of narrow, that it's a sit down, recorded, one on one life history interview that is transcribed and goes into an archive to become a primary source document, right? And even the interview is often used as a synonymously with oral history, as if all oral histories happen in an interview form. Um, but the, all of those assumptions about what oral history is actually are part of our uh, heritage of colonization and appropriation of indigenous oral history practices through a process of really intentionally deciding what's gonna count as official oral history and what's gonna be excluded um, in, the, in the interest of sort of legitimizing oral history as an academic research practice. And so here at OMA, rethinking what oral history methodology is, is a really important part of our ongoing process of thinking about what it means to have a, a decolonial and an anti-oppressive approach to, to doing oral history. And that's the underlying goal of this series. So uh, in the series, we're gonna be hearing tonight about uh, what it would mean to think about uh, having AI be part of doing oral history. We'll hear about doing oral history through scuba diving and looking at drones. We'll hear about doing oral history in groups, um, all kinds of things that sort of destabilize those basic assumptions. Um, and so tonight's event is gonna be about using AI to do oral history, but it's also gonna be about housing and the struggle for housing um, and the particular challenges, challenges that come up when we're doing oral history as part of a social movement practice around housing justice. And so we'd like to invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, you can say uh, where you're from if you want, but the, the important thing we wanna know is where's home for you? And you can say a little bit about that if you'd like. So please go ahead just while we're getting started, introduce yourself in the chat, um, reflecting on the prompt, where is home for you? And we typically have people um, in these events from all over the world with, with very complicated experiences of home. So we're eager to hear what you think about that. Um, I'm gonna introduce Brett Halperin, our speaker, and then I'll turn it over to him. Um, he's gonna present and have some opportunities for interaction in the chat. Um, and then we'll have a, a Q and A and some small group discussions guided by our oral history MA students. Uh, so more formally, Brett Halperin is pursuing a PhD in human-centered design and engineering with a graduate certificate in cinema and media studies at University of Washington, Seattle. His research has been supported by multiple awards and published in the fields of human-computer interaction and design research. He's a U.S. National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. His work has been awarded best paper at the Association for Computing Machinery CHI Conference on Human Factors and Computing Systems, which might sound like kind of a specialized thing, but is the premier international venue for peer-reviewed uh, human-computer interaction research. He holds an MS from University of Washington, a BA from Brown, and he studied at the Rhode Island School of Design. So a really interesting interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary transdisciplinary background, which I think is why he's been able to do this really unique research. Um, he's actually in New York now as an adjunct faculty member at the Technology, Culture, and Society Department at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. Um, so please join me in welcoming Brett. And Brett, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that intro. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here with everyone. I will share my screen right now, and we will get started. Um, okay, so um, I think you can all see my screen now. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, that intro and for uh, everyone joining here tonight. 
Uh, it's really exciting to be here sharing this work with this audience and to be kicking off this amazing series that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, so yeah, thank you uh, to Amy and to the MA program for uh, hosting this. Uh, so uh, the, the central question tonight that we're gonna explore is, can AI collect oral histories? Uh, but really that question could also be asked as, could it and should it uh, collect oral histories? And so that's what we're gonna get to the bottom of tonight. And the answer might surprise you at the end. So uh, you'll see where this goes. Um, and so, yeah, uh, let's just get right into it. Um, so this work uh, was done with uh, many different collaborators, primarily the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. And so I'm gonna provide some background on the project. Um, it's a data visualization, digital cartography and multimedia storytelling collective with chapters primarily in the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, and New York City, where I first got involved um, almost four years ago. And the uh, mapping project uh, primarily maps oral histories of displacement and resistance and creates what uh, co-founder Aaron McElroy describes as these technologies of the otherwise that produce anti-racist imaginaries and materialities. So when we are engaging with technology and media and stories, we're very much focused on what some alternative versions would look like. Um, and, and that's where we're going with this AI inquiry. Uh, and really what I'm gonna focus on today is a sub project, one of many projects um, in the collective. Uh, the collective started in 2013, but I'm gonna focus in on uh, March, 2020 at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, which really created this pandemic augmented eviction crisis. Um, and at the onset of this um, crisis is when we started a sub project to digitally map the COVID-19 housing landscape, including oral histories, but also uh, much more. Um, and this was a really interesting conjuncture just in terms of how we had social distancing protocols, physical interaction was limited, a lot changed. And I'm gonna provide some context on that. Um, so it's just background, um, Aaron and I uh, wrote a paper about the design of the COVID-19 story map, which is important context because we're going to be exploring AI as a way of potentially plugging into this map. Um, and I'm going to just kind of briefly go through like what that map was so that you can see how we got to this question of should AI be involved or not. Um, and so really at the onset of the pandemic in March 2020, the project started with um, this evolving data landscape where we had to track all of the protections and information that was popping up through these eviction moratoria and housing uh, laws and policies and legislation differs uh, by jurisdiction. So that means if you're in Harlem or wherever you are, you could have up to four different levels of subpar protections, I will say. Uh, so you, they vary by city, county, state, or province, or national lines. So it's incredibly complicated and many people are not aware that that exists and that's how it goes legally. So that was how we initially started. Let's track this information. There wasn't yet a platform for it. We initially focused on California and New York where we have chapters, but then that soon expanded as our partners in places around the globe, like Brazil, Romania, other places that were starting to ask us to include their information on the map. There was a crowdsource feature. And so I came in really as a designer to facilitate a participatory process where we could bring community organizers, other people in the collective, tenants, et cetera, into the design of this map to figure out what it should look like, what kind of resources there should be, what kind of things we should design. And we also included different places where coalitions were building. And so that's like the red circles that you see here. Um, so really uh, what happened is we had about 10 people no money, uh, very low resources, like extremely scrappy, but somehow this metastasized into a global project. And that was kind of the beginning of where we found ourselves just really in over our heads and overwhelmed by the situation. Um, so even just making it work on mobile, right? As so many people, especially outside the US are not um, primarily interacting on the com desktop computer, we had to just configure so many different things. And at the same time, we had oral historians, part of our collective, that were starting to collect the stories that people were experiencing. So tenants, their experiences of resistance and eviction, and really the nuance that was involved in these situations. And we were documenting these stories um, in part because we really wanted to uh, share the, the complexity behind people's situations. For instance, there was one um, narrator who talked about how she was on fixed income disability insurance, and she had a roommate who had a visa through his restaurant. His restaurant shuts down during COVID. He loses his job. He goes back to his country. She's on fixed income, has no one to pay her rent, and her landlord wants to evict her, right? So you can just see like 
how complicated the ripple effect, like especially who this affects. Um, and so that was very much why we were starting to map these stories. Um, and uh, I think as we were trying to really meet the urgency of this moment where our community partners were really asking us to uh, meet their requests to get this information out there, um, we had to balance this sort of rapid response with also careful community building. How do we get these tools out there, but also do it with care and make sure that what we're making is not just rushed out the door, but really like accurate and done well, and that we work well together along the way. I think certain pressures at some points uh, escalated to the point where there were different interpersonal tensions, human to human conflicts, um, areas where at points we had to just stop the work we were doing and try to repair some of the damaged relations. Uh, so you can see that there's there's a lot that had to do with just even navigating this work as a collective. And at the same time, the protections were turning into evictions. So different protections were expiring at different points in times, like your county protections might expire, but your state ones don't. And again, really small team, everyone's a volunteer. How do we possibly keep up with this work that we were already so invested in at this point? Um, and so... This is what the map initially looked like uh, before I kind of joined to redesign it. Um, and it was it started with a smaller scope. And it was clear, though, that as it was growing, some things had to change. And one thing that will kind of foreshadow this discussion of AI is just how, as a collective, we feel about technology and tools more broadly. We often find ourselves negotiating our values with our need for practicality, for efficiency, to get the job done. For instance, uh, you know, there was no search bar here uh, at the beginning. So people had to like manually zoom in and peel through layers, right? But essentially, as everything was growing, we needed a more sophisticated design, we needed more sophisticated tools, there was all this opportunity to think more about how we can make it more accessible, how we can incorporate more languages, and how, of course, we are frustrated with our technologies, and maybe we can think about different ways of addressing a lot of these challenges that we were facing. Um, and so the last um, sort of point here, it's frozen on my screen, okay, um, is what we're calling um, the time-based media life cycle. So in the production of the oral histories, as I'm sure everyone or a lot of people here know, um, oral history is a temporal medium. It has a duration to it. You pause, play it, it unfolds over time when you listen. And sustaining that whole process of, of the, producing the oral histories was, uh, I want to say, impossible, really. Uh, and, it, and it was particularly impossible uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, where what happened is, in our collective, we have some very seasoned, uh, skilled oral historians who have been doing the work for a very long time. But then we also have people who are joining the collective for the first time, do not have a background in oral history, but want to pick it up and, and contribute. And so that requires um, training them, that requires onboarding them, that requires getting them situated, acclimated to the work. And that also means that some of our uh, best oral historians are, are focused on that, right? So um, and then what happens during a pandemic is the people who we just trained, onboarded, et cetera, um, get COVID, are facing their own housing precarities, um, have someone in their family or a loved one who, who dies, right? So it was just like, um, incredibly difficult to complete a full single story all the way from like initial contact with a narrator to then preparing for the interview, conducting the interview, transcribing the interview, editing the interview, mapping and disseminating the interview, and, and also preparing all the metadata. And so basically what happened is we had all these people that maybe joined in the beginning, but then dropped off at whatever stage, right? And so then we had this massive backlog. Meanwhile, people who kind of stuck around had their own work to do. And so even to this day, uh, we actually still have a backlog almost four years later that we haven't gone through yet. Um, and so it was just very clear that our current processes were not entirely sustainable, yet at the same time, we were being told by our partners, this work is so important. Our community organizers want to share the stories, shift the narrative that was being put out there. Um, and so I feel like it's important to provide that context when we kind of move into this next question of probing uh, the AI support. And there was this uh, tool that we tried before the AI where we had a community partner that we worked with to create this way for people to just upload their story directly. So there was just like a question here, upload the story directly. But when I talked to people about their experience with this tool, I found that they felt like there wasn't enough guiding in the way that they were telling their story. They just had one question, they had to do video, which also for some people was kind of a non-starter. Uh, but even if they were comfortable with that, there wasn't that sort of conversational interaction that we do in our oral history interviews, where we interview someone, there's a whole double 
consent methodology. It's very complicated, uh, but it essentially allows for facilitating that dialogue to help the person tell their story. And this tool wasn't really sufficient in that. Um, so that's where we get to this question of, as I was kind of experiencing all of this, working with the oral historians, working with the developers, the data researchers, as kind of a designer, I was sort of like in between all of these uh, roles. And essentially the situation was this. Um, we had 30 to 40 million people at risk of eviction in the U.S. alone, in the U.S. alone. And of course, there, that's tons of possible people who might be interested in sharing their story, building the movement. We know that having a high quantity of stories is, is impactful in terms of showing how many people are affected by these issues. And so it was really a question of how do we sustain and increase access to storytelling, given all the grieving, all the burnout, all the things that were happening. Um, and because I am a design researcher, um, what I'm really interested in is the human factors in these systems, how computers can support cooperation, how uh, we might design these interactive systems. And so I did this study here with uh, my co-authors um, where we're basically exploring what people's values, hopes, and fears are around AI through the design of what I'm calling a conversational storytelling agent or a CSA for short, which is essentially a dialogue system, a form of conversational AI that would facilitate storytelling with different narrators similar to an oral history interview. Um, and so the way that the study worked was as follows. It was a community-based design study, meaning that the design process was built around uh, the community that I was working with already. So I interviewed 17 people, primarily people who were part of the anti-eviction mapping project or our partners. So people based in Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco, New York, and um, also a couple people in New Orleans, since I had previously worked for Habitat for Humanity there, I had a few people that I reached out to as well. And uh, five of these people were narrators, which are essentially people who had experienced housing insecurity um, and were telling their story. And they kind of were pr pr providing that perspective. Uh, um, I do want to note that like no one who was in the midst of like crisis was participating. It was people who had some sort of ongoing struggle and were in a safe or secure enough place to participate. Um, they were also compensated. Um, and uh, we paid particular attention to uh, different identities that are more prone to housing insecurity. We know that it does not strike all groups equally. Um, it actually uh, mostly affects uh, different people along axes of gender, race, class, sexuality, um, uh, disability status, um, people who are formerly incarcerated. So uh, 14 out of these 17 people um, had one of those particular identities and 13 out of the 17 had intersectional identities. And we wanted to make sure that we were getting the perspectives of people who were more prone to these uh, issues. Um, and then we talked to four story collectors, which is essentially a more broad term for oral historians, but it also included a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. Um, and then eight collectors slash narrators, which are essentially people who had dual perspective, meaning that at one point they might have shared their story or experienced housing uh, insecurity, but then joined the movement and started documenting and collecting other people's stories. And one thing to note about that is that in some ways that is a form of mutual aid and movement building mechanism, where when we have people meeting through this process, it can lead to um, some, some enduring relationships and even build capacity in that way. Um, and so the narrators have faced a wide range of issues, all kinds of uh, housing insecurities, domestic violence, eviction, landlord abuse, gentrification, displacement, etc. Um, and the way that we did the study was um, I designed these two visual mockups that you see here. One was a little bit more inventive, the black background, and then the other one looked more like a typical chatbot messenger. Um, and basically just to see how people reacted to different styles. I also mocked it up in Spanish uh, because I know that language is often a barrier in the space and to explore different uh, possibilities there. And then the way that the storytelling simulation worked is we use this method called Wizard of Oz prototyping where without actually developing the AI, we were able to simulate it and explore it. Um, and I can answer any more questions about that process, but essentially for the narrators, it was interacting with a text file where they would see questions appear, respond out loud. It was as if they were interacting with AI, but it was actually a little bit more constrained process in terms of how that programmatically occurred. Um, and so then I had these 17 interview transcripts, everyone I talked to for one to two hours over Zoom, analyzed them thematically and did a close reading to uh, get at different insights that I will be sharing today. Um, so as we move into that, uh, I'm going to share one sample story documented with the CSA probe. Um, the CSA is the AI. Um, and this was a story uh, by a narrator um, who um, 
who was based in San Francisco, identified as white, uh, but also LGBTQIA+, non-binary, uh, formerly incarcerated, disabled, and had a baby during a pandemic eviction. And I do want to set that context to, again, emphasize like who or, and is like affected by these issues. Um, and so this is the, narr the narrator story. I went from barely being able to afford rent to definitely not being able to afford rent. My landlord was extremely wealthy and he tried to make me feel bad saying my efforts in organizing against the eviction was going to be futile. Trying to make working class person feel bad for them losing thousands of dollars when I haven't seen thousands of dollars. I worked so hard to give 90% of my income to housing. The minimum wage hasn't been raised and nothing else has changed that would make it more possible for anybody to pay more in rent. Housing for felons and people with low credit is almost impossible. That's not something I first saw when I was convicted. Um, so, of course, this is, uh, you know, a, a reduced version of the story, uh, but it does get at these intersecting precarities and the way that um, these, these situations were unfolding for people during this pandemic uh, augmented eviction crisis. Um, so now I'm going to move into the different findings that came out of interviewing people and asking them their thoughts about the AI. So this is going to break down into how collectors perceive the tool, how narrators perceive the tool, and then we're going to talk about how the tool complicates things. Um, so first, um, before kind of moving into the AI, um, I do want to just uh, touch on how the uh, collectors or the oral historians um, do the storytelling process without the CSA. And it's important to first understand the existing practices so that we can then have that context to understand how AI may or may not fit into that. Um, and so one thing that became extremely clear from talking to these brilliant oral historians who are so good at what they do is the importance of addressing positionality and rapport. So essentially thinking about these place-based relations, how social identities come into play, how we uh, they can make the narrator feel comfortable and having like this, um, you know, genuine human to human interaction. Um, and, and among these uh, many different tactics and strategies and methodologies that are involved, um, one um, common thread was referring to the interviewees as narrators. Uh, so the people sharing their story, calling them narrators to denote that this is their story and the collectors saw them as their role as there to provide emotional support and guide the storytelling, uh, but really uh, facilitate this kind of narrator led storytelling by actively listening and asking follow-up questions based on what they choose to bring up. So they're not there to control the narrative, but there to help that person tell their story on their terms as they want it. Um, and another thing that's um, become really interesting is the importance of physically witnessing the narrator's story grounded in these place-based relations. So I'm in New York, you're in New York, like I'm seeing and hearing and witnessing what happened to you and to kind of give you that affirmation as someone who is like, you know, you get that feedback from another person, they have witnessed what your story and what happened to you, at least on this secondhand way. Um, and, and really it's about building this relationship with the narrator that is not just transactional, but beyond this story sharing exchange. And that also means viewing the person as not just a storyteller, but also as like a complex person, a neighbor, a tenant, a friend. And so after the storytelling, if it seems like it would be appropriate to inquire about any social support needs, offer any resources, and really just see like how that relationship might be able to live on or not, if that's something they are interested in. Um, so now I'm going to talk about how the collectors uh, perceive the AI tool. Um, and one thing that was clear was that uh, there's this potential for if you imagine the AI like plugging into that story map, um, that it could potentially expand story documentation, accommodate more formats, increase access. Um, people in this low resource grassroots context were very aware that there's these severe challenges of operating with low resources, people are burning out. This could very clearly bolster that existing work and practices that are already underway. It would kind of just plug into this project that's already happening. It wouldn't be trying to like, you know, uh, install new practices or just kind of like parachute in with something that has absolutely no relevance. Um, and, and people also really appreciated the, the Spanish version and liked the idea of the multi-language support and how that might increase linguistic access to storytelling, given the limitations of some of the collectors who might not be fluent in all the languages when we know that many people who are affected by these issues might not speak English, or at least not as a first language. Um, and there was also just these very clear kind of benefits in terms of how the AI might streamline um, the back and forth coordination hurdles and friction. Often people reported that the narrators would kind of maybe 
indicate some sort of initial interest, but then like in that scheduling phase is often where they drop off when it's like, you know, when are you available? Oh, I do these times, you do that these times. And, and you know, they have a lot going on. So people forget, and then they might end up never sharing their story. Um, and so really this would just offer this kind of like any time, regardless of schedule, regardless of time zone constraints. And that in some ways could bring more people in to participate, increase access in ways um, when there are these kind of hurdles in the human to human process. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, um, and now I'm going to talk about how the narrators perceive the tool. Um, one of, I think, the most interesting findings from this study is how um, there are these burdens that can be associated with storytelling, and the AI, in some cases, for some people, definitely not for everyone, uh, but for some people, certain people, it can alleviate some of these burdens that might be associated with anxiety, fear, shame, the time and cost of participating, um, and so it was very clear that in some ways the AI could circumnavigate some of those time constraints, offer a short form storytelling option kind of on the go. Like when you set up an interview with a person, often the oral history interviews could be one to two hours. And you, that is kind of asking a lot from someone and they might expect like they need to be there for all of that. But this could be, there's like not that same sort of accountability. And so someone might be able to share a story more within their means when there's kind of not that pressure to stick around for however long. Um, and there's often a lot of shame that can be associated with these experiences of housing insecurity, given how the dominant narratives are framed around victim blaming and, you know, it's your fault, like you didn't work hard enough, like you got yourself in this situation. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, the AI might be a better option for some people who feel too ashamed to even face another person. Um, of course, like we should work to shift that narrative and remove that stigma. But one narrator said, um, I can see situations where I might not have the capacity to speak to a human, but this feels better. Um, and other people often fear, fear landlord retaliation um, or just other fears of consequences of sharing their story. And even though the oral historians do take great care in terms of anonymizing and protecting people's identities, people could share their story with an AI without having to reveal themselves to even a single person. And some people found that appealing. Um, and then there is also people who had uh, social anxiety uh, and like as one narrator said, um, I didn't feel stage fright from talking to a human when conversing with the AI. Um, and another person said, um, I would choose a robot over a random human because humans are going to have their own judgments and thoughts about your experience. And so to have them in the back of my mind, I think would be a bit distracting. Um, now, this person did also say that he would rather have someone he knows or knows of than a robot, but it is interesting to just think about how um, relative to a stranger or someone who might not know, um, there is sort of this greater comfort um, in this um, tool that's perceived as non-judgmental, et cetera. Um, and in terms of uh, like how the storytelling experience went for the narrators, um, in many cases, it did do its job, so to speak, in terms of facilitating an affirmative and supportive storytelling experience. Uh, the narrator spoke to how they appreciated the prompting, the opportunity for catharsis and the reflection, um, and how it kind of guided the storytelling, unlike that other tool, which was a limitation, this provided that conversational interaction to facilitate that and guide the way that the story might be told, uh, but not control it. Um, people described it as empowering and feeling heard, um, they liked when it expressed affirmations, um, and I programmed it with different sort of language and vernacular that is often used in organizing language um, to give it some sort of personality, and some people thought that that was like cute or funny and enjoyed that interaction, um, and other people also described how it facilitated uh, this catharsis. Um, as one narrator said, it did feel good to speak out and not feel like I'm talking to myself I'm constantly thinking about housing insecurity, having another outlet for it other than organizing over it, agonizing over it in my own brain and just making excuses for it feels good to be able to have that catharsis. So um, in some ways it did uh, facilitate that, but at the same time, as with any technology, it also can create new burdens and, and risks that we should be aware of. Um, as one narrator said, I haven't told that story in a while and it's bringing up a lot for me. I just wonder what that would be like for somebody having all these scary, intense emotions coming up and then not having the support around afterward. So um, as you can see, there's there's a lot of risks associated with this tool, and that's now what we're going to move into. Um, so how does it complicate things? Um, one thing that was extremely clear was that uh, at least the people who participated in the study had very uh, negative associations with artificial intelligence and automation. Um, and so it was, it was interesting because... Uh, 
again, sort of in this theme of technologies of the otherwise, where we're trying to explore this concept of AI for housing justice. In many ways, like people didn't really know what to make of that because it was like, AI is bad, automation is bad, but like, maybe this is good, uh, I don't know. Uh, so really complicated feelings, um, but people talked about how their other experiences with conversational agents uh, can be uh, annoying, dismissive, invasive, deceptive, as one narrator said, I'll call my corporate landlord and have to dial a number talking to a robot. And to me, it's just annoying. Let me just talk to a person and fix my problem. Another person described how it's literally dehumanizing. It's taking a human away. Um, as another person said, if you're a tenant, you're already dealing with so much dehumanization, especially if you're using a big property management company, you're used to all this automated profanity. Um, and, and so we can see that these other sort of experiences related to housing with automation and AI have largely been negative. Um, and as someone else said, if you're somebody who's been in the system, it feels like your AI can tell what I'm saying, but is it really helpful? People who are engaged in systems that continue to oppress them are very adverse to forms of technology that feel like they're gathering information without a human touch. It's insensitive. And um, the last one here is uh, from the collector perspective who had this fear of it replacing and displacing humans. She said, can a robot really replace me as the interviewer? I have a little bit of a knee jerk anti-automation thing. People are losing their jobs because everything's being automated. But in this situation, it's like the opposite because there's not enough of us. So again, the theme here is very, very complicated emotions, right? Uh, where we see these were the same people in many cases as the prior slides talking about the good things, right? So there's good things and there's bad things. And because I'm a researcher, I'm not here to like scale my AI startup. I'm sharing both and interested in both. And that's really what we were investigating. Like what is the good, what is the bad, what are the opportunities? And again, it goes back to this um, sort of conflict of emotions where in this grassroots setting, there's low resources, people are burning out. Like we could really use all the help that we could get but at the same time, there's a lot of skepticism around these tools. And there's good reasons for that, right? Um, it could advance, there's different harms that can come from AI automation and the digitization of stories. As I kind of alluded to before, there's different emotional support limitations in terms of its ability, inability to comfort people verbally, help them process their emotions, and even physically, as one person said, it's never going to give you a hug, right? So huge limitation there. Um, for some people that support is, is really important. Um, there's also these insidious biases that are rendered invisible to people. A lot of people describe saying there's not really bias, it's non-judgmental. No one's like, you know, judging me for what I'm saying. Um, but then that could also lead to these risks of oversharing um, and people regretting what they shared by sort of thinking this robot is just in their phone. Um, and, and really that could also have different consequences. Um, additionally, in its like algorithmic substrate in and of itself, it's a self-selective tool in terms of who it supports along different axes of ability, age, digital literacy, um, and more. As one organizer who had organized in many different cities shared, he had experience in, in tons of different places, and he said he could see a tool like this being very successful in New York or San Francisco, but in New Orleans, where uh, the digital media literacy rate, he, he in his experience is lower, he said this would not work at all. Um, so it also just is more transactional in its inability to sustain these relationships or friendships beyond the story sh sharing exchange itself. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it, there's it's cutting out that potential for relationships to come. So um, a few things uh, to kind of uh, discuss and, and just reflect on here is we have these three things happening. One is the shifting role and character of these documentary or oral history methods. Things are changing with AI. AI uh, might foreclose these human connections, right? Real empathy, emotional support, place-based relationality. What does it mean for the AI to try to be do doing that or, or cutting out a human from doing that? Um, but at the same time, there is something kind of exciting and opportunistic about it expanding our means of storytelling, particularly for people who might otherwise not participate. Um, as Janet Murray says, we need to keep expanding our means of storytelling to collectively reimagine who we might become and what can come of that is, is also kind of exciting. Um, but there are these tensions in storytelling at greater scales. Um, as we see, enlarging the scale can increase access, which you know many people agreed was like an important thing, um, whether it's with language or uh, what have you. Um, but uh, enlarging the scale can also be uh, quite uh, harmful and it can 
uh, undermine other grassroots work if this did, you know, intercept or get in the way of like actual oral historians. Um, and it could also banish meaningful diversity, meaning the ability to kind of adapt and tailor the storytelling process to a particular person and their situation rather than having this kind of like rote programmatic experience. Um, and it can also potentially even delocalize stories from the on the ground action, from the jurisdiction based policies that are really important. If just anyone can come to this tool and upload a story wherever they are, how do we make sure that that's part of like a broader movement, that that's around some sort of organizing objective? Um, and so uh, basically what we uh, say in, in this uh, paper, and I am just going to share, um, oh, I see it's already in there, uh, but uh, yeah, so basically um, what we call for in this paper, and I will just share two other links as well, um, is this notion of adjacent mediation and responsibility. And this is inspired by Tina Camp and Tanya Perez Bustos, who talk about how, like, if, if a tool like this were to exist, we want to think about how it can be an adjacent offering, but not ever intercept or, or get in the way of the work that the oral historians or other people are doing. Um, so again, thinking about how it could bring in people who otherwise might not participate. Um, and another thing that became extremely clear was that when automation and AI comes into this process, it makes the adjacent person-to-person -person activities that much more important to do the stories justice. Yes, there's something to be said about just the storytelling experience itself, where the narrator has the opportunity to reflect and have that catharsis, but it's also important that someone's actually listening to that story, hearing it, and that it gets out there and it's reaching its full listening potential, whether it's through listening parties or through different forms of dissemination. Um, and you know, if there was never even a single person listening to that story, um, it's more important and more crucial that there are ways to do that. Um, so basically, um, that's kind of, I think, the, the broader recommendation where, especially in context where maybe there's no oral historians, right? Like a tenant union, some people suggested, like if there's an organization that has no storytelling capabilities at all, but could benefit from them, a tool like this might be uh, good, right? Um, but actually um, where I land on this and, and kind of going back to this question of like, could it and should it, um, for, for me, uh, I think that in this particular context, when we're talking about housing insecurity, we're talking about eviction, we're talking about displacement, we're talking about these dominant narratives where people are being told uh, that again, like this is their fault, no one cares if they live without housing, no one cares about them, right? And so it, it's really important for another person to be there and to say, I care, I, I see you, I hear you physically witnessing that story and essentially saying, I'm a fellow human and what you're experiencing is inhumane. And when that is coming from a robot, it's artificial. And so for me, I mean, it, it, it's not something I'm going to personally be pursuing further. I think we learned a lot of really interesting things and there are definitely real benefits from it. Um, but in terms of what's next for me in this design space um, is, is really thinking more about how we can augment rather than automate people, um, how we might embody oral histories, how we might work on the dissemination part, how we might foster listening. Um, and so I'm just about done here. And so what I'm going to do now is um, just share this three minute video. That's kind of a preview of what I've been working on. Uh, then I do have just some concluding remarks. Um, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A and discussion and, and the rest of the program. Uh, so I'm going to play this video. OK, can everyone see my screen still? Good. Okay. I think of home now, I think love. First is a physical space, I think love. I think anywhere that love is present is home. This electronic denim jacket is streetwear designed to amplify urban social movements. These interactive patches play songs, stories, and poems about urban housing struggles and climate injustices, but also moments of joy, hopes, and dreams. When you use this metal thimble to touch these X's sewn on the patches, a small computer inside gets triggered to play different audio tracks through the embedded speakers. You know I'm headed to the funnest thing you We've been waiting long Things ain't going right Just wanna feel it if you're not Electronic streetwear can unlock new ways of knowing, being, inhabiting space and deeply connecting with the stories by feeling the vibrations of the audio You're wearing and carrying the memories with you My family was evicted twice I just remember like being in my house and 
having to stay in my room while people are like going through the house, having to be unseen, being told by my mother that I'm not supposed to be here right now. People forget the community is only relevant because of people. So when you're displacing all the people in the community, it's like, where does that culture go? Where does that community go? Redevelopment came in like gangbusters. It was just really weird. Weird seeing whole blocks just come down. It was like they came down overnight. And if you look around the Fillmore now, it's a whole different place. Everything that you would recognize was just gone. Almost all of the black families were gone. So we're hoping that the children put these kids in college and give them a scholarship so that they can look after their communities and they will have the most compassion because their families, just like my families, are impacted by this. We're talking about life and death. Something says, seek shelter, seek shelter. The other way said, you're gonna die in these streets, you're gonna die. This jacket was assembled as part of a multi-city coalition with community partners in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York City, St. Louis, and Seattle. Wearing this jacket can raise awareness by drawing attention and making people want to learn about these different issues in our cities. What was it we did? Was it our skin? Or was it our pride? that you didn't trust well we're not sorry okay so now i'm just going to close out with one last slide here um and give me just a sec um so basically um in conclusion uh while ai might help elevate more crucial voices it is imperative to never abandon traditional oral history and storytelling practices, which at the end of the day cannot and should not be reduced to digital mediation. Huge thank you to all of our courageous narrators and partners and uh, the Columbia Oral History MA program, Amy and everyone for inviting me here to share all this with you. Um, this QR code goes to the paper, but it's also in the chat. Um, so uh, yeah, I welcome any questions. Uh, and we also have some uh, discussion questions uh, to do breakout rooms after. Um, but yeah, I'll just pause here for now. Thank you so much, Brad. That was really amazing and a great, a great presentation with a lot of nuance and a lot of ideas in it. Um, we do have some time for open Q&A, so folks can definitely put questions in the chat if you'd like to. You also can raise your hand and and unmute to speak. Um, so if anyone has questions or also just thoughts and responses, um, let's hear from some people in the audience. Jenna, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, Brett, for that. That was super interesting. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about on a technical level, like how your team dealt with what you were receiving um, and also how it was for user interaction, like just a little bit more than nuts and bolts, like what were the stages and how they sort of would answer one and then the next one. Like if you could just go into a little more detail. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Brett, definitely. Do you want to um, stop sharing screens so we can see each other a little better? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so the the first question was um, how we, do you mean the, how we handled the stories from the map um, with the AI or without the AI? I just meant, you know, I mean, I would imagine technically that was a lot of managing. I mean, like receiving the data and how you sort of dealt with them. I, I just thought it would take up a lot of work to actually, I don't know, like what were you doing with it once they answered it? Where where did it go and how did your team sort of address the technical side of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so yeah, so I'll, I can talk first a little bit more about how like the AI worked um, and and how we dealt with that. And then I can talk a little bit about how like the the mapping project was dealing with that. Um, so with the AI, um, we use this method that's called Wizard of Oz prototyping, which is essentially where instead of actually building out the AI, we do a wizard. Um, 
And we do it for a few reasons. One is that um, it, it's a low uh, fidelity kind of scrappy form of prototyping, which research has found people are more honest and give you more critical feedback when they work with a prototype that indicates to them that you haven't put that much effort into it. Um, whereas they're more sensitive to hurt your feelings and like don't want to offend you uh, if they see that you've put a lot of work into something. Um, and it also kind of saves us the time and cost of like actually building out a tool that at the end of the day, I concluded like was not something I wanted to uh, push forward. Uh, so uh, basically the way that the Wizard of Oz prototyping works is um, I shared my screen and there was like a text file that they would see and they would see like a question. And so I use questions that we would use in our manual process. And then I would have like this kind of canned set of different questions. So like a question bank, you could think of it because that's how it would work programmatically. So there was a limited number of questions and kinds of questions it could ask. And same with different kinds of utterances, which are essentially different ways of segueing the conversation or an affirmation, again, different like canned responses. And so basically it would ask a question, the narrator would respond out loud, and then it would give an utterance, like some sort of affirmation or segue the, con the conversation and then ask another question. Um, and then they would respond out loud. Um, in terms of processing that data, uh, I did that. It took like, you know, a full year or so to really like do that project. Um, but then in terms of the anti-eviction mapping project, that manual process involved many different people who were involved. Um, and it was really just a matter of different volunteers working to kind of transcribe, edit, process it. Um, and yeah, that was kind of this double consent oral history methodology that others in the collective have written about as well that's cited in the paper. Um, so I can definitely share more specific resources if you, if you wanna get like more into the details, but that's kind of a high level overview. Thank you so much. Uh, Ananya, do you wanna ask your question out loud or do you want me to, um, to read it out? Um, I'll read it. I can also read it out loud. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, how is the feedback collected? Um, the so it was collected uh, through these like one on one interviews that I conducted. Um, so basically, we would uh, first start with me interviewing them, like just getting to know them a little bit better. But I did recruit primarily people that I had talked to before or someone who I knew knew them. Um, but so basically, there was kind of like a warm up. Uh, then there would be like this uh, storytelling simulation. If it was a narrator, if it was a collector, it would be showing them different visual mockups and um, asking them about their experiences doing this work uh, manually and understanding the existing practices and best practices. Um, and so it was all through conversation with me in these like one to two hour interview formats that were recorded. So then I could generate a transcript. And so it was just direct Q and A, me kind of having particular questions I want to ask, but then based on what they were saying, also to ask more follow-up questions um, accordingly. So it all had to be said directly to me, um, I'm sure, you know, but I did try to encourage people to be critical and, and made it clear that like, I wasn't just interested in what's good, but also what's bad. Um, so that way to try to get more honest feedback as well. I can give a little insight into that too, because I think I can reveal that I was one of the narrators for this project. So I was one of the story collectors that was interviewed, which is part of how I know about the research besides being connected to the anti-eviction mapping project. And uh, I think I can add that Brett used an ongoing consent process, even for these research interviews. So he checked back with me a bunch of times about like how I was willing to be named or identified and like gave us chances to read drafts of the paper and give feedback um so it was really neat to be on that on that side of it um there's a bunch of questions in the chat i think the next one is um from sarah at StoryCorps. uh she asked can you talk about any resources you might have used to mitigate fears around data privacy or automation interesting um yeah thank you for that question um I would say that uh, I didn't do that uh, because I was primarily interested in understanding people's fears. Um, I wasn't yet at this stage of trying to address them. Um, so first it was for me is like, what are people's fears in this particular context? Um, so I, I didn't try to like change anyone's mind. Um, so I, I don't have an answer to that yet, um, unfortunately, but I do think uh, people's fears are for good reasons also uh, was one thing that did come up. So. Um, I think we don't really quite have a resolution on what to do about all that. Uh, but I think um, what was interesting in terms of the automation piece is that some people didn't perceive it as automation at all. Some people were like, 
particularly people who I think um, were more immersed in kind of the burnout that was happening and really witnessing like just how kind of low resource the operations were. I think people were like, didn't feel as sort of threatened by the potential displacement. It was like very clear that, you know, in their particular context, it would be an augmentation, uh, but other people, you know, it did seem more like automation. So um, I think the fears kind of varied, but for the most part, were well justified. Also, the Oral History Association gave some of our NEH money to the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project to do some research on narrator privacy and data protection. In, and there's a white paper on that that they're finishing up that should come out, I would say, in the next couple of months. And I think that they'll be pre presenting at the Oral History conference in Baltimore. So another branch of anti-eviction mapping project is doing some really detailed thinking about that and updating their um, oral history manual to, to think some of that through. Um, Emma asks, do you see any future for using AI to organize and deliver stories that have already been collected? And if so, how to do so without using the human element of a project? That is in part what our next workshop is event is about, sorry. Uh, Chris Panza is going to talk about using AI to analyze large bodies of oral histories, but Brett, what do you know and think about that? Um, I The only thing that really comes to mind um, is Stephanie Dinkins' uh, oral history chatbot, which I know you did a prior session on, I think, a couple years ago, um, where she explored like a, a chatbot that would tell oral histories. Um, so there might be opportunity that she like created this really amazing sculpture, so it was like an artwork. Um, in terms of like organizing um, the masses, um, perhaps that could be like a systematic way to do it. Uh, but I think often these stories are um, most influential in these more intimate settings when like one story, for instance, is shared with a legislator who then starts like internalizing that narrative, using that narrative like on the job. So I don't know um, if automation would be helpful in that case, but maybe that should be a study, I'm not sure. Uh, Paul has a question about um, how to sort of differentiate these tools for different communities. It's it's kind of specific. Paul, do you want to ask it out loud? Oops. Oh, sorry. Technical difficulties. Hello. Um, we're doing uh, citywide barrier detection. Uh, so right now, the way that requirements are being built for cities, it's usually the dominant cultural aspect, dominant language. And other things like, uh, so even things like uh, the the angle of a sidewalk, it's built usually on on a male uh, uh, test subject, I guess. And so the the issue we're, we're we're going forward with is so we have all these equity deserving populations within the community, and how do we accurately um, segment it so we can have archetypes? That we can like benchmark those requirements. So, it, using story form, gather uh, the things that are important for this particular uh, intersectionality or group of intersectionality, uh, intersectional aspects, and then um, computationally uh, use that to find out how to make the city better. Um, yeah, that, so I, I can repeat for sure. Um, maybe do I just say it once more? Like, I think I get the context, but so is the question like how you would do that or what is, yeah. okay. So go ahead. Um, so I, I guess where I'm coming from with, with that question is sort of from the perspective of a designer. Um, and often I veer away from, um, archetypes or trying to kind of, uh, generalize, uh, certain groups of people. Um, often there's a tradition of that in design called user personas. Um, which I've uh, found to not be uh, particularly useful just because I think it can always be uh, quite, um, uh, it, it, we just want to be careful about generalizing certain groups. And so I, I would worry that that would not necessarily, I don't know enough about that particular endeavor, just hearing it off the cuff, uh, but I would just be kind of conscious of trying to generalize broader groups, um, especially just what this study really illuminates is 
the nuanced uh, situations that people were in. And so there wasn't really a way to kind of group people or try to uh, make certain conclusions about uh, people of certain identities or even forms of housing insecurity. Uh, but that's just, you know, my own sort of research. I, I don't know the full extent of what you're doing, um, but uh, I, I don't know if that could actually be like computationally or quantitatively assessed, uh, but maybe that's something to look into. I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one more question before we go into some smaller group conversations. Um, so Ananya asks, how long have you been involved with anti-eviction mapping project before doing this project? And if this project was something that the oral historians um, asked for from anti-eviction mapping project, um, I'm going to add a follow up to that. Also, I'm curious about your decision to not continue working on this prototype and developing it. And if there were people who were like, if it, was anyone really disappointed about that? Like, are other people going to take it forward? Or is this just like a totally dead project? <laughs> Um, so I, I, okay, a few things. Uh, so one, I've, I've worked with the collective now about three and a half years. Um, and so I was working on like the manual project. I was very involved working with both the oral historians and part of that process. And I was involved with uh, the data and research and, and development teams. And so those were two different meetings. Um, those were two different working groups. And I was like very immersed in both of them. Um, and I had been like working with the project, getting to know everyone well enough, um, being in that project and experiencing kind of all the challenges that I went over that I sort of had this hunch that um, given what we were experiencing with the limitations of that other tool, where people would just kind of upload a video based on a question, which our other community partners had made. Um, and that tool like wasn't really, I don't think, um, taking off in a way that we had hoped. And at one point it also shut down because it was also like volunteer based. And so it was like quite precarious. Um, and so there was certainly an opportunity. Uh, it didn't come from the oral historians themselves. I don't think that they were thinking about you know, uh, that and the development team wasn't either, I think just because everyone was already really overwhelmed. Um, but outside of this volunteer work, I am a researcher. And so I think a lot about technology. And so I did have the thought that like, perhaps this tool, this form of conversational interaction could help us increase access and offer some of those benefits like language justice and whatnot. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, it, it was sort of my idea, but that's why I explored it before actually building it. And so um, I think that, um, the reactions, you know, you you saw them. It was a mixed bag. Uh, there was positive and good. Um, I think people definitely saw opportunities for a tool like this to uh, exist in certain contexts, like the tenant union and whatnot. Uh, but I think there was also enough hesitation around the fact that, like, we already have oral historians doing this work, and like, yes, our um, we have a backlog that we haven't even addressed yet, and yes, we could benefit from more resources and things. But at the end of the day, like. Um, you know, I, I was working on like three, four different projects already. Everyone was spread very thin. And so ultimately I decided to move forward another project, which was kind of that jacket extension um, where it, it felt more right to think about how this was so close to automation, but like maybe there's other ways of augmenting things. I don't think anyone was like super uh, disappointed um, because also part of the research process was, was uncovering knowledge and insights and um, exploring feasibility. And so even though we didn't actually end up making it, there was a lot of things learned along the way. Um, and I think that there's also a lot of utility and value in these insights um, that can you know be translated to other similar contexts and grassroots scenarios. So um, that's kind of my, my long answer to that question, uh, but definitely continuing with the work, just thinking, taking what I learned from this process and iterating in this design space towards something that I think can have less baggage um, associated with it, where automation is quite fraught. Um, I'm actually looking now also at um, some of the film worker unions striking against AI and thinking about like how it intersects with other forms of media and storytelling as well and labor and, and justice. So lots of opportunity to kind of just iterate on the vantage point through which I'm looking at automation, uh, but I think definitely keeping a more critical stance. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to see the like total 180 from the chatbot to the jacket. Um, one of the reasons people like coming to these events we hear is that they get to meet and be in conversation with oral historians, people who practice oral history from all around the world, as we saw through the introduction. So we did want to give a little bit of time for people to talk about what they heard and raise questions and discuss in some smaller groups. So Solby has breakout rooms made. 
Um, we're going to send you all out for 15 minutes and then we'll come back um, and invite people to share a bit of what happened in those conversations. So Brett has shared some prompts, which I know all of our students have. We should have one of our OMA students in each of the breakout rooms to help facilitate. Brett, do you want to just, um, do you have them handy to drop them in the chat? Yes, I will do that right now. So Brett will drop them in the chat um, and um, enjoy. We'll come back and we'll have uh, at least 10 or 15 minutes to uh, debrief from the small group conversations and keep keep thinking about what this work means. Yeah, so everyone will be um, has been assigned to a room. So I'm just gonna open them all. Um, they'll be open for 15 minutes and there'll be a, a sign that pops up when um, we're one, one minute away from coming back so that everyone doesn't get zapped all back into the big room. Um, so I'm just going to open them up now. We'll just let everybody kind of come back in and then I'm super, we're all super eager to hear what you talked about in your smaller rooms. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're just eager to hear what came up in your conversations. If you have any more questions, but also comments, thoughts, um, I think we can just have a pretty um, free-flowing final section here. Feel free to raise your hands or use the chat. Um, yeah. What came up? I'd be happy to nominate Lori, maybe unwillingly, <laughs> to talk about the point that they made about um, at the end of our session. <laughs> Not sure if they're here, but if they are. No. Oh, I see Lori's <laughs> here. Phone. Sorry, I don't know. switched to my phone and I'm having um, time figuring out the phone interface because my oh. computer booted me off, oh. <laughs> but I'm here. Hi, I joined um, y'all's breakout room truly for the last three minutes as I figured out um, technology things, but um, I was sharing a reflection that um, that a part of a way to kind of, yeah, my reflection was around resisting the urgency to record oral histories as we are actively moving through um, the trauma of a like, big historical event. And there are times when it is urgent, there's legislation, there's people's lives um, on on the line, and that's important, and we get contributions in that way. Um, but also if, yeah, if we don't have the capacity to do it in the moment, um, oral history is still also memory work, and so memories will be there after we are able to engage with them from like a safer place, both like emotionally in our bodies and physically and in our environments and spaces. So that's kind of how we left that. Brett, if you have thoughts, you can share them. Otherwise, I'm just interested to hear what other people think about that or what came up in other conversations. Yeah, I'm interested to hear other people too, but I think that's a beautiful point. Um, a definitely a great one to raise and uh, definitely reflect on and think more about for sure. In our group, we or I don't want to speak for everyone because I'm not sure if everyone shares this opinion, but in our group, I feel like there was a there was a general tendency toward kind of like, uh, 
I don't know how far we need to go. Like, I don't know how far I personally and my work need to go with AI in oral history right now. And I, I personally thought it was I would like a breath of fresh air, Brett, when you were like, I'm a researcher. I'm not here to scale my AI startup. I'm here to see what works and what doesn't about this. And what and just in my in my opinion, what a responsible approach to this question that is kind of unavoidable at this moment in time. Um, and then we we ended our conversation. I hope it's okay that I share this point that I or my understanding of it, Chris, that you ended on and feel free to add anything that I missed, but kind of wondering that given in our small conversation, we weren't so keen on on mixing oral history or AI in the interview part of oral history. Like, is this a, is the, is the humanness of oral history at stake? Like, is this a, in this particular arena, like is, is this a question that we have to grapple with or are we all gonna, are most of us gonna come to the natural consensus that like this doesn't belong in this part? Um, and I think Chris's reflection, as I understood it, was like, this is a tool that's not going away, that's most likely not going away. And so whether or not, whether it ends up being a good and helpful tool is going to depend on the people using it and how mindful and careful they are with the implementation of this tool. Chris approves. Yeah, I really liked, Brett, the um, idea you brought from Tina Compt about sort of, I can't remember what the, it was a, a like a theoretical term I hadn't heard before, but like a yes and kind of, kind of thing that like, this should never replace the work of oral historians. But I, I appreciated hearing how some narrators, for some reasons, felt like really preferred to talk to a chatbot than a person. And that totally makes sense to me. Like, I've heard from narrators who like prefer to talk on the phone rather than in person because it's like relaxing to not see the other person and I I wouldn't want to narrow the options for people to share their stories and especially you know people who have social anxiety like all kinds of reasons that someone might want to try this so I I, I totally understand why you are not pursuing it but I hope that the idea doesn't die because I do think it like first there's a lot of ways in which it 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 could increase access to people being able to tell their stories like probably not for most people but for some people yeah totally and it, it even uh processing the last uh reflection too like I I do think one thing that was very clear to me was like everybody is so different everyone is so nuanced like some people are like you know, actively publicly organizing against their eviction, like want to tell their story as it's happening in that moment. Um, and like, we'll tell it as one person said, like, I'll tell my story anytime, anywhere, like I'm ready to go, had like very little emotions associated with it. And then for some people, it's like an extremely overwhelming, intimate experience. And so I think just like people are so different. And, and one thing that will work for someone is not going to work for someone else. And so I do see opportunity for, for some people who might otherwise not participate for sure. Uh, something like this could work, but definitely still thinking about how we preserve, um, you know, the, the tradition itself. Caesar, go ahead. And then Sarah. Hi, uh, so um, I, I brought up a little bit in our group about how, so my university is connected to a hospital system and um, you know, they, in 2020 just kind of, you know, started using AI and medicine a lot more. And they recently are coming up with this health equity and machine learning. Um, uh, I don't know what you call it installation or whatever. And, and they're, they want to create a board around it. And one of the first things they brought up was using it as like a way to help a doctor like take notes when they don't have a lot of time with patients. And so also a uh, background, I'm a community health worker. And community health workers are kind of locally, but also nationally kind of reaching this kind of tipping point of, are they going to become like a real part of like care teams and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And I think of them as very necessary way to increase the humanity in medicine. And so like the idea of like using AI in a place where a community health worker would naturally fit to like help a doctor or help a patient, like, you know, communicate better with their care team is very alarming to me. And so that's part of what really interests me about this. And also as a person who is interested in oral history, 
And so I just wanted to know what you all thought about that, if you have concerns about it, because I think AI and medicine could do great things like, you know, we're using it to look at billions of x-rays to like find things that our eyes can't see like, but I think that's a far cry from using it to kind of like, I don't know, be your be your electronic assistant in your patients, you know, in the, in like the waiting room or in the doctor's office. I was thinking about that too, like thinking about AI as a way to address burnout for oral historians that like, obviously the way to address burnout for oral historians is to hire more oral historians and pay them better. And like, <laughs> right, like um, it's not that there's actually a shortage of people who are able and ready to do this work. It's that there, you know, there's wealth not flowing in the right direction. So um, yeah, I, I hear that. I'm curious to hear what other people Think or Sarah, if you want to jump in. Yeah, I wanted. Um, I did want people to, uh, to give people their opportunity to respond to what Caesar said because it was so interesting. I never thought about that. I did also want to respond to what you said. There is no shortage of oral historians who are willing to do the work, but there is a shortage of money funding them. And in my organization specifically, our grants are based on the amount of output we're putting out, and um, that does create like a false sense of speed the uh, other um i i missed their name but i was just what the person who spoke before mentioned made me think about what we practice which is that if somebody starts crying or is having a difficult time in the middle of their interview we stop the interview and we can do even like up to seven different recordings um that then get consolidated and i think that that is potentially a place that can't be filled in by AI, which I don't have a solution for, but I like just an interesting consideration, I think. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Paul, what are you thinking? I really liked uh, Caesar's thoughts. Um, so you know, as a geographer uh, in the healthcare system, it's interesting uh, being from the States and coming to Canada because Canada and the UK do this thing called the social deprivation index. And there's two ways to be poor. There's materially poor and socially poor. And they both negatively impact health outcomes. In the, in the States, it's more that healthcare. And so uh, it's it doesn't matter. It's it's working because people are sick and we're making money is the one perspective. And that's you know really kind of a, a, shot, a political thing to say, but that's my opinion you know, being in other places where it, it's more preemptive. You figure out, you can map on a map who's at risk for what and preemptively go after it. But all this to say that Caesar's point is really important because uh, by mm, erring on the side of efficiency rather than people, you start to walk that line of, okay, are you uh, endangering somebody's health by being overly efficient and relying on machines and taking the human element out of it? So it's it's a it's a really really good question. I thought. So it sounds like we can basically we had this event. We can basically let the rest of the world know the answer is no. <laughs> Oral histories cannot be recorded by AI, <laughs> um, with lots of caveats. But um, we're gonna have to let me let me close out and see if you want to stick around and chat a little bit. I saw your your comments in the chat and they're super important. Um. But let me just say thank you to Brett for joining us. Um, thank you to folks from Anti-Eviction Mapping Project for supporting this project. Um, also, I think everybody knows our next event is also on AI, more on the processing backend side of things uh, with Chris Panza, who I think is here. Um, and I'll shout out to that the Oral History Association is having a symposium on AI and oral history in 2024. Um, we'll send out the call for proposals by email to everyone who's registered for this event. So if you have stuff to say, if you're doing work in this area, please consider signing up to participate in that. Um, thank you also to our students who helped to facilitate tonight. Um, so we can officially and there, Thea, I'm very curious to hear what you have to say. If you're still here, you're welcome to share. Um, and students, stick around. We'll do a little debrief afterwards. But thank you so much, Brett. Thank you so much for having me. And it's so great to meet everyone here. Thanks for joining. Um, it was really a pleasure.